Humanity's adoration for the gleam of gold has been around for thousands of years. We've even been willing to steal and kill for it, and individuals have come up with all kinds of zany schemes for acquiring it. But while many have mined for gold on land, it has not escaped the attention of some intrepid explorers and innovators that gold might come from the ocean as well. After all, there is much more water on Earth than land. So if those waters could be a source for gold, fabulous riches might be lurking for those creative enough to withdraw it. Believe it or not, this might not be as crazy an idea as it initially seems. It's undeniable that there are vast quantities of metal in the ocean. There's gold, silver, copper, and also metals like cobalt, which is used to make cell phones and computers, all of which float around in the form of tiny particles. These particles end up in the sea either from hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean or from rivers that empty their contents out into the deep blue. But before you get your wetsuit and metal detector out, there are a few issues to bear in mind. The problem is the concentration level. To get yourself an ounce of gold, you would have to process an estimated 40 billion gallons of water. That's enough to fill more than 60,000 Olympic swimming pools. The National Ocean Service claims that there are 20 million pounds of gold suspended in the ocean, but this gold can only be found in parts per trillion. As for gold deposits on the seafloor, scientists estimate that there's about $150 trillion worth down there. That's $21,000 for every person alive today. We have yet to come up with a technology to mine it safely though. After all, would you want to go to work every day as a miner in goblin shark territory, where pressure is 1,000 times the standard atmospheric amount at sea level? I sure wouldn't. But ore within seafloor rock isn't the only type of gold available at the bottom of the sea. The sediment itself holds untapped reserves of metals like gold in tiny particulate forms. Intriguingly, patents like this one have already been filed, which can filter vast amounts of sediment taken from the seafloor utilizing charged particles chosen for their ability to extract gold from sediment mixtures. Though the amount of gold recovered is small, these technologies are an important step in harvesting the gold reserves our planet holds in the deep blue. That's all useful, but it doesn't tell us how to get the gold that awaits us in the seawater itself. Getting gold in this way is a problematic endeavor, but if we're going to give it a try, we can learn the do's and don'ts from those who have tried before us. It's clearly not easy to grab yourself some of that gold from the sea, but some individuals have insisted that it can be done. When we talk about gold in seawater, the first name that is worth mentioning is Edward Sonstadt. Sonstadt discovered in 1872 that there was gold in seawater, and the notion made quite a stir, as you can probably imagine. Sonstadt's study estimates the concentration of gold in seawater to be 65,000 micrograms per cubic meter, a small but significant amount. Stick around to find out how you can get your hands on some of this stuff. In the 1890s, after word of oceanic riches had begun to spread, one of the most famous attempts to mine the ocean for gold was carried out. The New England pastor Prescott Ford Jernigan claimed to have invented a device worthy of the fanciful name, the Gold Accumulator. The accumulator was a wooden box with holes cut in it to allow water to pass freely. Inside the box was a pan of mercury, which Jernigan claimed was mixed with a secret ingredient. A small battery ran an electric current into the mercury. The idea was that the electrified mercury mixture would suck precious metals from the water to create an amalgam which the gold could then be extracted from. In the morning, gold would be there waiting. Jernigan had quite a tale to go along with his gold accumulator. He claimed that he'd had a heaven-sent fever dream wherein the inspiration for the contraption had come to him. Jernigan and his business partner Charles Fisher were able to perform a test of the apparatus that seemed to go well, or at least to the satisfaction of a group of investors. Jernigan provided 1,000 of the accumulators to drag the waters for gold, raking in around $1 million in investor cash, approximately $29 million today, considering inflation. But by July of 1898, the operation broke down. Investors went to check on their venture, but Jernigan and Fisher had disappeared. It was discovered soon after that the entire business was an elaborate hoax. Turns out, during the initial demonstration, Fisher had swum down to the accumulator and planted a gold-laced mixture inside. The accumulators were little more than soup kettles. Jernigan fled to Europe with the rest of his family, miraculously escaping jail time. No one ever saw or heard from Fisher again. However, this would be far from the last time that the scientific or pseudoscientific community would take an interest in extracting gold from the sea. In 1900, the London inventor Henry Clay Bull filed a patent for a device that he claimed was for extracting gold from seawater. 
Bull's idea was to take tanks of seawater that he collected and add lime, the mineral, not the fruit, to them, which would combine with the iodide of gold in the water. This would create iodide of calcium from which the gold would separate and settle at the bottom of the tank, where he could collect it easily. Images of the invention show how seawater, taken directly from the ocean into the machine through a pipe, would enter a large chamber, into which lime would be added. After a suitable amount of reaction time, the water would be removed, leaving a gold-containing sludge at the bottom of the tank, ready to be transported up to a conveyor belt for further processing. But it doesn't seem as though Bull ever put the device to widespread use, or if he did, then there's no account of it. Based on the description, it appears that he had high hopes, but perhaps he decided at some point after the patent filing that his plans weren't as feasible as he once thought. Those who are interested in trying Bull's method can certainly do so. All that you need is a receptacle, some seawater, and the lime for separating the gold from it. If it works, just remember who told you about it. Moving along to the 1920s, another notable name from the Gold from Water saga makes his appearance. Fritz Haber was an extremely successful German chemist, mainly known for being the father of chemical warfare. Haber had another, more peaceful passion project, with aims to use gold from seawater to replenish German wealth following World War I. He gathered a team of scientists and they put their heads together to try and tackle the problem. While little is known about the specifics of Haber's plan, his previous successes in the field of chemistry, which won him a Nobel Prize in 1918, filled him with enough confidence to pursue the project for a decade. However, like others that came before him, Haber eventually had to admit defeat. He acknowledged that he had made a mistake in his initial calculations and had overestimated the potential gold yield by a factor of 1,000. He'd run into what would become a common problem. The cost of getting the gold out of the water exceeded the gold's value. But that didn't mean it was impossible, as you'll see shortly. Next to get in on the gold from seawater idea was a name that you probably recognize, the Dow Chemical Corporation. In the 1930s, a plant in Cure Beach, North Carolina was extracting bromine from seawater. They had come up with a way that it could be separated from brine by forcing bromide particles to fuse with iron turnings, which could then be further processed. They felt that gold, silver, and other precious metals would soon follow. You can probably guess what happened next. Time passed, funds grew harder to justify, and Dow never uncovered the secret. Dow Chemical joined the growing list of failed gold from seawater pioneers. In the years following Dow's attempt to crack the code from getting gold from seawater, things went quiet. For a while, in 2012, Mark Sullivan, an inventor and biomedical engineer, came up with an idea for an eco-friendly generator with some surprising byproducts. The intention was that a vast reserve of superheated seawater in a complex machine especially designed by Sullivan would create a powerful tornado of vapor and air, driving the generator's turbines and supposedly providing a source of renewable energy. It just so happens that, as a byproduct, the superheated evaporation of seawater during this process would separate minerals including gold particles from the water which could be collected within the boiler tower. Sullivan took his invention on the popular TV show Shark Tank looking for funding, which brought him some public attention, but none of the investors on the show were convinced and his idea fell by the wayside. Sullivan still insists that his machine's design is sound and that it can be used to both create clean energy and extract the metallic riches of the ocean. Unfortunately, the initial energy required to superheat the water, which he asserts would be mostly solar, brings the viability into question. Yet Sullivan still insists it would be a very profitable endeavor. Perhaps someday, if a backer is willing to put up enough money, we'll be able to see if either clean energy or ocean-filtered gold can come from his blueprints. If you've got a spare million or two, maybe you could be the one to hit him up for a 10% stake in his tornado generator business. The problem is you may end up like all other past investors I've mentioned and spend hundreds of times the value of collected gold on your efforts of extracting it. While efficiency remains a central issue, the last name worth mentioning suggests that hope is not completely lost. In a 1934 study, Dr. Colin Fink of Columbia University was successfully able to extract gold particles from seawater using a method similar to gold plating. When submerged in seawater, a negatively charged, rapidly spinning cathode was observed to accumulate a tiny, yet undeniably visible deposit of gold. This took a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of seawater. But whereas no other approaches were ever officially confirmed to be successful, Frink's method actually worked. While some gold particles did accumulate on the cathode, a large amount did not due to its colloidal properties, meaning it remained spread out in the water. Another problem with Frink's method is that it cost five times more than the price the gold would have yielded. But the important thing is that it worked. 
by taking Think's methods, which seem to have been largely forgotten with the passing of time, and rejuvenating them with modern advancements in technology, we might be able to make this more viable. Recent studies have found that high-powered lasers, as well as acids and even sunlight, can be used to accumulate particles of gold in colloidal solutions, offering a potential answer to the shortcomings of Think's original experiments. Even more promising are entirely new methods in development, like using bacteria that naturally accumulate minerals from their environment to separate metals from water. This method has already been investigated for use in water purification and mining alternative elements from the brine that's formed from desalination plants, and it's only a matter of time before someone harnesses the potential for extracting gold using bacteria. But as promising as these methods are, they don't change the fact that while extraction may be possible, the relatively low concentration of gold in the oceans makes it extremely difficult for it to be economically viable, for now at least. But that's the real problem here. Even if you did find a way to filter the gold, the more you filter out, the less concentrated gold is in the water itself, meaning there will always be a point at which it's uneconomical to do so. Still, if you're set on pulling a golden fortune from the waters, maybe sunken treasure is your best bet. While it is difficult to calculate just how much is out there, some estimate that tens of billions of dollars are there for the taking. In 2012, Spain won the looting rights to the gold of an old Spanish ship that had sunk two centuries ago near the port of Cadiz. This haul alone is worth almost half a billion dollars. Just watch out for those goblin sharks. So what do you think? Do you have better ideas on how to cash in on the sea's hidden riches? Or do you think it's just a ridiculous idea? Let me know in the comments section down below, and thanks for watching.